13. G. Stanley Hall, The Child-Centered Society Granville Stanley Hall, 1846 to 1924, a man from Massachusetts and Mayflower stock, was, like Dewey and others, to give evidence of the radical reversal of all Puritan values that characterised the messianic educational theories of latter-day New Englanders. Hall, best known for his recapitulation theory, held in that dogma that the supposed recapitulation of evolution by the embryo was also characteristic of the development of man from birth to maturity. This theory, while now denounced, still leaves its marks on the current curriculae. Hall's influence in other and less publicised areas is more decisive. Prior to his every particular theory, Hall held to a faith which was the presupposition and governing motive of his entire concept of education, namely that education is a scientific discipline which must conform to the biology, anthropology, physiology and psychology of man. Moreover, since the governing fact in these various sciences and the life of man is the concept of evolution, this concept must be basic to any valid approach to education. Thus, tests and measurements, psychological studies, biological factors and conditions rather than abstract religious or moral principles must be the basic approach in education. Two important approaches to this ideal means of education were for Hall the questionnaire method and the recapitulation theory, both now discarded as are the German psychologists he valued so highly. But the emphasis on this scientific approach has been deepened and broadened. His students alone, however they later differed from him, were in many instances a major factor in developing a scientific and psychological approach to education. They included John Dewey, J. McKean Cadell, W. H. Burnham, M. W. Swift, Phyllis Blanchard, Florence Mateer, M. H. Small, Howard Odom, E. S. Conklin, E. W. Bohannon, Edward Conradi, H. D. Sheldon, E. B. Huey, G. E. Partridge, L. M. Terman, J. H. Luba, E. D. Starbuck, H. H. Goddard, and many others. Nickel Breaths, pioneers in industrial psychology, a field of interest to Hall, studied under him also. At Johns Hopkins, Woodrow Wilson took minors with Hall. Hall was also the head of a notable attempt, Clark University, to establish a purely graduate institution of higher learning, the project ultimately failing because of Clark's failure to support it adequately. A brief survey of some central aspects of Hall's thinking will serve to indicate the nature of his influence. First and foremost in Hall's philosophy of education was the doctrine of evolution, with its then current belief in recapitulation. Hall by no means originated this theory, but merely popularised its educational usage. According to Hall, the child repeats the race. This is a great biological law. Accordingly, Hall insisted that intellectual demands on the child were unwarranted and kindergarten should be continued to the age of eight. In youth, rationality comes to the fore and a highly intellectual discipline of study is then necessary. Prior to that, learning is by play. Much of the radical imbalance between grade schools and academically oriented high schools is due to Hall's recapitulation theory, with its belief that the child is also a primitive man with limited intellectual abilities. For Hall, the line of separation between animals and man was a false one. In his ideal society, Atlantis, the unity of man and animals is affirmed Animals are our elder brothers and are far better adapted to their conditions than man has yet learned to be. They have taught him many arts, and the lives of many of them are full of morals for man as the animal epos here, which was very highly developed, abundantly shows. 
Many species are our direct ancestors, and all of our cousins. Man needs their strength, keenness of sense, power of flight, as well as their hides and flesh. Each ascending order was once a lord of creation, till at last man became their leader. Medicine and hygiene were largely the products of experiments upon them. Even now all their wisdom and industry combined could perhaps surpass that of man. They are our totemic ancestors, and natural objects of fear and love, and great educators of these sentiments in us. Such an attitude is not surprising, although Hall's romanticism made him more ready to follow its implications than most. If every child from the moment of conception to maturity recapitulates very rapidly at first, and then more slowly, every stage of development through which the human race from its lowest animal beginnings has passed, then man, by virtue of evolution, is closer to his animal past than to the greatness of his human present. This animal past all men share, their great human achievements are the experience of the few. Thus Hall inevitably downgraded reason, however much he sought to promote it. However, he trusted instincts far more than reason. According to the biblical doctrine of man, long influential in the Western history, man, created in the image of God, is only to be understood in terms of God, but for Hall, the race is to be understood in terms of the child, and the child and race in terms of evolution and the primitive past. The application of animal psychology and experimental results to education thus quickly developed in later years. The principle that the child and the early history of the human race are each keys to unlock the nature of the other applies to almost everything in feeling, will and intellect. To understand either the child or the race, we must constantly refer to the other. This means then that geneticism is the key to knowledge and to the understanding of man. Hall's recapitulation theory is largely bypassed today, but his insistence on geneticism is not. It has merely taken more sophisticated forms. Hall, with some reservations, welcomed psychoanalysis and the work of Jung and Freud because, like evolution, it was a form of geneticism. The basic law being no longer recognised as God's, but nature's, and evolution being that law, geneticism in one form or another is an influential factor in educational premises. Second, as a result of this new law, the study of the child became central to educators and child study continues to be emphasised. In 1893, Hall insisted, the school of the future must be based on original child nature, a logical conclusion in view of his premises. Accordingly, innumerable studies of children's thinking, activities and interests, as witness Hall's own, the story of a sand pile, were made and regarded as new wisdom. The concept of play as education, by no means original with Hall, received new focus and added impetus when set in the context of his evolutionary faith. Play thus became a central teaching device, as did dancing, pantomime and like activities. For some time, therefore, this school must teach through play, and then with youth apply discipline, remembering always the late arrival of intellectual skills and their artificiality. As Partridge, with Hall's approval, summarised it. Both reading and writing are usually taught too early. For countless centuries in the race, language was all oral, and it should be so for the child during a longer period than is customary. Reading and writing as processes are artificial and uneducational in themselves. Therefore, the less we appeal to consciousness and effort in acquiring them, the better. By delaying them until precisely the time when the mind is best adapted to such drill and working intensively, trusting much to the child's native powers of assimilation, they are learned much more readily and more perfectly than when they are attempted earlier. 
oral language methods are correct, for they put more work upon the memory, afford a more natural state of attention, and make use of rhythms and cadences which greatly assist the child in learning language. Methods of reading and writing cramp the attention to a narrow focus, take away the interest from the content and put it upon the details of form. Third, Paul held to the parallelism of mental and physical life, so that a sound mind requires a sound body. E.B. and Arrowwood have gone so far as to call this Paul's fundamental theory. Paul he revealed an insistent consistency of theory. If the supernatural be denied and the unity of mind and body be affirmed, then the sickness of the one must be the sickness of the other. Accordingly then, as Hall held music to be understood, must be danced. I believe it is not going too far to urge that no music of any kind is or can be fully comprehended without motor accompaniments. As a result of this concept, projects, activities, folk dancing and other motor activities became the means of learning, and books were relegated to a subordinate or coordinate position. Dewey used this same concept extensively without bothering to reaffirm or argue it. As all pointed out, Dewey formally bypassed Hall's theory and actually operated on its basis. Fourth, the childs became the norm, both for education and for all of life. Love of nature and of children is the glory of manhood and womanhood and the best of civilization. In his old age, with unquenched faith, Hall repeated his lifelong premise. Childhood is the paradise of the race from which adult life is a fall. Just as in the Renaissance man remembered again his golden age and a new lights came into the world, so we live in an age of the Renaissance of child life, and all teachers who carefully answer a good questionnaire help on the dawning of a new day, whether or not they have ever heard of pedagogy or of phibics. As Curti has observed, like Parker, Hall made a gospel of childhood. Childhood, as the norm, meant the subservience of all society to the service of the child, a goal largely accomplished in modern society by the educational apostles of this faith. There is really no clue by which we can thread our way through all the mazes of culture and the distractions of modern life, save by knowing the true nature and needs of childhood and adolescence. I urge, then, that civilizations, religions, all human institutions and the schools are judged truly, or from the standpoint of the philosophy of history, by this one criterion, namely, whether they have offended against these little ones or have helped to bring childhood and adolescence to an even higher and completer maturity as generations pass by. Childhood is thus our pillar of clouds by day and fire by night. Paul knew his Bible well enough as a one-time divinity student at Union Theological Seminary to recognise that this last reference was tantamount to saying, Childhood is thus our God. As a consequence of this faith, the God childs could not be forced in his learning. His curiosity and interest must be aroused, and the child then gently led into learning. We must bear in mind that interest is the very Holy Ghost of education, and that so-called formal studies and methods of discipline are only, for the most part, a delusion and a snare. They make degenerate mental tissue. It is not culture to learn to speak or write well upon trivial or indefinite subjects, but rather to keep up with the great human interests, which will come to expression spontaneously if they are given a fair chance to do so. Spontaneity, permissiveness and freedom to educate oneself through the elective system were thus cardinal emphases from this perspective. All could speak happily of the results of this educational approach and insistence on child study. 
Instead of the child being for the sake of the school, we have had a Copernican revolution, and now the school, including its buildings, all its matter and method revolve about the child, whose nature and needs supply the norm for everything. Hall had hoped that Clark University might gradually be changed to devote all its funds ultimately to the cult of the child. The child and his play became the sources of wisdom and must be studied and understood. Play, at its best, is only a school of ethics. To force a child into book learning is wrong when his natural activities provide the best means of education. It is by no means surprising in view of all this that Hall was hostile to the biblical doctrine of original sin and total depravity. How then to account for sin was a problem he refused to give much attention to, although, like all romantics, he was ready to ascribe it to environment, which environment included other persons. Thus, with regard to sex, wherein he followed the sickly romanticism of the Havelock Ellis type, the sinner was always sinned against by society and hence not culpable. As he described it in his ideal Atlantis, each party was made to realise that it was vastly easier to win than to hold affection, and since, as we have seen, failure to do the latter involved separation, the methods and spirit of courtship must be maintained through life, for there was no legal or religious bond to be relied on to perpetuate a loveless union, so that these were almost unknown or impossible in early Atlantis. If, as rarely happened, a husband fell a victim to inebriation, Gossip became curious about his home table and the attractiveness of his domestic circle. If he sought other women, Gossip suspected that the wife, who had every advantage of position, propinquity, safety and seclusion, had not surrounded the most sacred part of the marital relation with all the subtle charms of allurement, of very gradual approach and finally the full abandonment of which this relation is capable and without which it is liable to lapse. For what married man, they said, could possibly forsake all this for a few wild hours of surreptitious orgy with purchasable favours. If a wife went astray, the husband was suspected to be at fault, for it was felt she was probably a victim of his neglect, overabsorption in outside affairs, failure to study and adjust to her nature and needs, or at least to her moods and fancies, or that he had become less, not more, a lover the reverse of which should be the case. With every year of domestic companionship, or perhaps he had been wanting in thoughtful protection, or had shown the imperfection of his true paternal feeling by relaxation of tenderness when it was most needed. That is to say, at the time when from being his mistress, his partner's life began to be transfigured by motherhood. If then he had allowed her trust in time, which is so often tried and strained at this season, to falter and be cloud her bliss over her newborn, it was well understood that this impaired her true maternal function and handicapped the future of the child. Such an attitude with its radical belief that character is the product of conditioning places a double burden on the parent, who is then assumed to be totally responsible for the life of the child. Paul thus contributed materially to one of the great myths of this dying age, one summed up by more than one pompous judge and child expert in proverbial fashion. There are no delinquent children, only delinquent parents. The effect of this myth has been to further this irresponsibility of the child, coupled also with evolutionary mythology which has been used to imply, as it tends to, that each generation is or should be superior to the previous one and therefore needs to break its shackles in every area, it has come practically to mean that rebellion is youth's destiny, an assumption characteristic of this present culture and by no means the biological or common cultural fact it is presumed to be. The child is the norm, his greatness is his closeness to the race's primitive past and his future lies in his affirmation of those primitive roots. The pathway to progress lies through primitivism, backward to Eden. 
we must collect states of mind, sentiments, phenomena long since lapsed, psychic facts that appear faintly and perhaps once in a lifetime, and that in only few and rare individuals, impulses that it may be, never anywhere arise above the threshold, but manifest themselves only in automatisms, acts, behaviour, things neglected, trivial and incidental, such as Darwin says, are often most vital. We must go to school to the folk soul, learn of criminals and defectives, animals, and in some sense go back to Aristotle in rebasing psychology on biology, and realise that we know the soul best when we can best write its history in the world, and that there are no finalities, save formulae of development. For Hall, the doctrine of evolution was the fundamental fact in terms of which all life must be reorganised, and as a revelation of magnificent law within nature, it required that man must turn religiously downward to that fountain rather than upward to any god. It even seemed to me that evolution rightly and broadly interpreted gave a new basis for democracy and government of, for and by the people, because the basal assumption of this political ideal is that the folk soul can be trusted, and this trust can never be complete until we fully realise that everything great and good in the world, including religion, science and the social and industrial order, has sprung out of the unfathomable depths of human nature. Because this folk soul can be trusted, it is the business of education, government and religion to work in conformity to the folk soul rather than some alien standard. Fifth, the new agency of evolution is the school called into being to bring about the great goal of evolutionary process. The school is thus sacred, possessing a holier consecration than the church. It is doing more than the church, for it is gradually uniting all creeds and hastening the grand federation of mankind. In terms of this, the elevating, moralizing power of school education, that is, state school education, is without equal. No institution in history has been as potent as the school, and all evolutionary agencies culminate in the teacher. Evolution has taught the teacher that he or she is to be the chief agent in the march of progress, and if we are to have a higher type of citizenship, of manhood or of womanhood in the world, it is to be done by conscious agencies, and those agencies culminate in the teacher. In the vision of the superman, it is ever to be realised it will be because the school, the college and the university will succeed in bringing childhood to more complete maturity, physically, mentally and above all morally. The physical man will be better developed. Hall felt the need for a demonstration school, set up with unlimited funds, to show the world once and in some favoured spot what can be done. People could visit this school, almost like an educational holy city to be prayed toward as devoted Muslims pray toward Mecca. And this pilot school would be the centre of reconstruction till the lump was leavened. The school would educate in terms of the gospel of childhood and the results would be conclusive. At least half the time, labour and expense now spent upon the three hours might at once be saved and the rest devoted to other and no less useful acquisitions. The experiments must be native to this country and in terms of its development and needs. As our republican democratic government is built upon the rights of man, so this school should be based upon a new interpretation of the rights of childhood. The true university as the centre of scientific research is, or ought to be, the chief and fittest organ for the evolution of the true superman, and without this at the top of an educational system is a truncated and arrested thing. Universities are, or should be, true shrines of the spirit and nurseries of the supermen. Men should think religiously as the medieval man did of his church, of the university, and the university invisible, 
the splendid temple of science, which is the supreme creation of man, would be man's new church of science. It will usher in the new third dispensation, namely the dispensation of the spirit. There was more to Hall's new religion of education. Culminating the whole fabric of his faith was his sixth basic concept, the state as the capstone of man's evolution. In and through the states, the process comes to fulfilment and maturity. All organic education may be regarded as educational, and the higher stage of evolution is social adjustment. This stage is artificial or telic, and it leads to a general spirit of altruism as the true self-interest. Hall, who cautiously admitted that he half accepted Marx, was strongly inclined to socialism as the true and unselfish order of man and society, although unwilling to champion it. For him, justice was essentially service, which begat happiness and virtue, whereas selfishness was wickedness. Civic virtue is the prime requisite of a good social order, and the schools should inculcate knowledge of the wickedness of the grasping private interests that flourish at the expense of the public good. The religion of public welfare culminates in social action. The vocation of teaching should furnish many true saints for the calendar of this new religion, and would, if the schoolmen were indeed a worship of the Holy Ghost, and if teaching were done with the abandon and self-abnegation which makes the work an inspiration to both teacher and pupil, and which gives some of this spirit of consecration to the race, which should be the religion of business of whatever kind. So sacrosanct should be his holy function of teaching, that it should indeed be a calling, and even boards that control public education should feel it, for they should be recruited from the best citizens, who never refuse but seek to serve, to give instead of to get, realising that office means only opportunity for usefulness. Hall was confident that the time would come when every young woman of leisure would consider it her duty to do something for others, and every young man who can will be a big brother to a younger boy needing help. Teachers will seek out the problem homes and become advisor, helper and friend to the families. Hall saw these things beginning to come to pass. Cities are now really getting souls. The school is the training ship for the ship of state, and civics must be the new religion of the secular schools. Thus, the state is again the true society of man and his actual God on earth. There can be no transcendent factor or God. Indeed, if there be a God, we serve him best by serving mankind. Theology, he said, must be converted to anthropology if there be a God. Perhaps he would now prefer us to neglect or even deny his existence if thereby we became more serviceable to our brethren. We can even say that perhaps God and his transcendentalities are dying again for the greater glory of man. All morality is doing good for others. Such an outlook is inevitable wherever a theocentric position is abandoned. If maturity is not the worship of God, then it is socialism and the service of man. For Hall, mature morality meant the abnegation of self for other men, and the best and surest means of this abnegation is statist action. However much Hall stressed the private means of service and conformed outwardly to laissez-faire thinking, he saw the civic and state forms as ultimately the surest and best. His socialism, though suppressed as inadvisable for the times, was still real. Hall was confident of the tightness of his views and ideas, and in his vision, equal, he believed, to Jesus and Buddha. In the views I have attained of man, his place in nature, his origin and destiny, I believe I have become a riper product of the present stage of civilization than most of my contemporaries have outgrown more superstitions, attained clearer insights, 
and have a deeper sense of peace with myself. I love, but perhaps still more pity mankind, groping and stumbling, often slipping backward along the upward path, which I believe I see just as clearly as Jesus or Buddha, the two great souls that ever walked this earth and whom I supremely revere. If my intellectual interests have been in the past and present, my heart lives in the future, and in this sense I am younger than youth itself. Paul's vision of man's return to Eden involved also one further factor, the glorification of woman in her purely procreative function. The woman is thus not primarily a person, helpmeet or wife, but a mother. Sex also became of central importance to Hall as having a redemptive function. As a psychologist, penetrated with the growing sense of predominance of the heart over the mere intellect, I believe myself not alone in desiring to make a tender declaration of being more and more passionately in love with woman as I conceive she came from the hand of God. I keenly envy my Catholic friends their mariolatry. Women, however, were deserving their femininity for mannish ways, but Hall was confident in the processes of evolution and their conformity to their true sphere. Meanwhile, if the eternally womanly seem somewhat less divine, we can turn with unabated breath to the eternally childlike, the best of which in each are so closely related. The oracles of infancy and childhood will never fail. The new education must be a true workshop of the Holy Ghost, and what the new psychology, when it rises to the heights of prophecy, foresees as the true paradise of restored intuitive human nature. Such was the faith and doctrine of G. Stanley Hall, philosopher, psychologist and educator, a zealous champion of salvation by means of a particular concept of education and prophet of the cult of the child 